Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome outside to my backyard. Uh, it's such a gorgeous day, I thought I'd move this outside for a change, which means I'm going to be squinting the whole time because I'm facing the sun, because I only have so much time to film, and this is probably the most attractive part of my backyard that you will see. So I'm sorry if I'm going like this the whole time. It's springtime, or it, it's close enough. Like, technically it's not, but it's close. Trust me, because I have plants popping up in the middle of my lawn that aren't supposed to be there. Right here. See? I got crocuses coming up. I did not plant these. Fun. But that notwithstanding, it's a beautiful day, so I'm going to enjoy it. You know, spring is a time of new beginnings, and at the same time, you can look at old things in a new way, which is a very awkward way of saying that today I wanted to look back at some of my childhood favorites. Now, I have kept not all, but a heck of a lot of books I had as a kid. I couldn't part with them. They were my companions, you know. I love them. Ooh, I'm in a bad spot for the wind here too, but it is what it is. Anyway, I just could not part with them. And I held on to them for my kids so they could enjoy them. And I think for the most part they have enjoyed them. I mean, I've read almost all my books to all my kids, all three of them. And they certainly seem to enjoy them okay. So, hey, they stood the test of time. That's awesome. I have so many books it was hard to pick just ten. I narrowed it down to ten. I don't know how. I will probably do a sequel or two or three. Uh, but for now, I thought we'd start with that classic of classics that most everyone knows, Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder. As you can see, my copy is pretty beat up. Most of my copies are pretty beat up because they have been read and reread and loved. I, even my copies that were new to me are frequently old because we get them at thrift shops or whatever, garage sales, but that's fine because to me that shows that it's been read and loved. And, oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> Look at that, there's even tape. Oh, there's even tape. Now, rereading pretty much all my books was a fun adventure, especially because so many of them I reread and I was like, these are really darn good books. Like, it's not just nostalgia talking. I swear, well, I don't think it's just nostalgia talking. They're just, they're so well written. They're evocative of their time and place, and they're not in-depth, you know, they're not, they're not grown-up books. They are children's books. But for what they are, you know, children's books doesn't mean they're bad. That means they're pared down. They're down to the essentials. So that's what I found with all the Laura books. They were very evocative of the time and place. Her descriptions are so strong. They really put you in that place. Another thing I noticed was the characters. They're pared down. They're simple. Yes. But they are believable. And that's interesting because human beings are complex, right? And hers don't go into super complex emotions because, again, it's for kids. If you read about Laura Ingalls Wilder and her, her life, the way it actually went, um, there, you know, this is very much like that, but there are some definite differences. Um, but still, the characters are believable. You feel like you know them. And the third thing, thing that I especially noticed that it, there's been discussion about it, like there was racism in the books. There was. There was. And I think that's something that it's important to be aware of and not shy away from. Um, it was part of the time. It was accepted. That doesn't make it right. It was wrong then. It's wrong now. Um, I swear I sound like the Warner Brothers disclaimer, but it's a good disclaimer because it was wrong then. It's wrong now. So you read something like that or you watch a movie of that time with racism in it, quite obvious racism, and you just, you need to understand that that's what it was like, that it was accepted then. 
I, I don't understand why. I, I do not understand racism or prejudice against people, especially the color of their skin. Like you can't help it. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to digress. It's, it's just my stance. Um, so when you read like her book, it's not this one, um, but especially the book where they're coming up with ways to entertain the town in where she lived, North Dakota, and a group of the men dresses up in blackface and does a minstrel show. Whew, that is hard to read. That is hard to read. Um, and especially how everybody in the town was so entertained. It was the best thing they'd ever seen. Um, so, yeah, that was hard to read. But, you know, I, I read it to my kids. I said, we're going to read this next chapter as it is. And afterward, we're going to discuss it, which is exactly what we did. And I, I don't know. I feel that's the best way to approach it. Um, so it's important to understand that there are bad parts. There are good parts. So... You take the bad with the good and um, just understand that that's, that was all part of life then. Um, and, you know, like I say, use that as a, a discussion point for your kids. And if you're just reading it to yourself, look back, cringe, go, whoo, <laughs> not good. Um, but I wouldn't discount the whole book, the whole book series because of that. Because even, like I say, even watered down, there are some serious stuff there. Like when Laura and Almanzo got married and had a house of their own, and spoiler alert, um, the whole thing burned down through an accident. That's really rough. And then also Laura lost their second baby and they never had another one, and she left some hard stuff in there. And wow. It's incredible to read that again and go, this is in a kid's book. Oh my God. It's pared down, it's light, but it's heavy at the same time. Right, moving on. Like I said, I don't have a lot of space on my phone to record things. So going from Laura Ingalls to Caddy Woodlawn by Carol Reary Brink. This was one, actually it's not my original copy. Uh, this is a newer one that I got off eBay because... I reread it from the library and I was like, this is really good. Why did I ever get rid of it? But this is basically the copy that I had. Caddy Woodlawn is, it's a very similar story to Laura Ingalls. And I, I believe there's a sequel. I haven't read that. Um, but the thing is that Caddy is, uh, she's one of a big family. There are more boys in her family. Laura's was all girls. Um, and it's interesting. This one also is, is well written. There are individual characters. Every member of her family, you get who they are. They're their own individual person. They're enjoyable situations and they're touching situations. Like the whole thing with the dog. The dog doesn't die. I have to mention that. The dog does not die. The dog is okay. Um, but yeah, there's still some moments like, oh, yeah. And um, like Again, being a product of its time for that, um, it, like Laura, this was written later in life, and it's based on uh, the childhood of the author, fictionalized. For being a product of its time, this one is a little better because Caddy's father is kind of the, the leader of his little area, as it, as it were. People look to him, apparently. People look to him... Um, as a leader, and he has very good relations with the local Native Americans, and it's very important to him to keep those good relations. He sees them as human beings. It's never stated specifically if he sees them as equals, but it's implied. And there's even a point where there's rumors of, oh, they're going to rise up and massacre us and all the, the white settlers are terrified and gathered and there's mutterings and some of the white men are talking about going after them. And it is a terrifying situation. Caddy is partly the hero there because she overhears it and she sneaks away in the night, in the dead of winter, so that she can warn her friends, the Native Americans, and is just and she gets there just in time, and they're able to avert the situation, and that is, 
that's, oh, again, this is a kid's book? These are the chapters that I read. I start getting emotional tearing up. I'm like, okay, kids, you're going to have to give me a minute. Just, uh, wow. Wow, it's it's not, I don't know, I suppose maybe you could see it as like a, a white savior type of story again. But then again, she was just trying to avert a situation. I, I don't think she was a savior sort. She was just a regular little girl trying to do the right thing and that's the sort of thing that it is wonderful to read and inspires you to try and be like that so I think it's a very good story to read to your kids or have them read to themselves moving on to book three or series three these the, the Pride and Chronicles this is a series um, I read this first when I was in third or fourth grade it had to have been fourth grade. Fourth grade. We went to Disney World <laughs> um, on vacation for the first time. Big deal. Um, and for homework, I was assigned to do a special book report. That was my entire homework. That was my project to work on during vacation. So I read the entire Pride and Chronicles and did a report on it. Um, and even at that point, I was um, the bulk of my report was how Taryn's character grows and yes you can definitely see that throughout the entire series not so much in the first one because really Taryn is not the hero type of hero he is the young man and he does grow a bit and he has interesting and exciting adventures but he's not the hero hero Gwydion um, is the hero hero here hero 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 anyway there is growth of really all the characters over five books. Taryn is just the most noticeable. Um, there are well-realized environments, and the characters are interesting. They are really interesting. There are exciting, if it is somewhat well-worn, if you're familiar with them, plot devices, but this is a good intro to fantasy. I'd say it's second to read after the Narnia Chronicles. Like, you start with the Narnia Chronicles, and when your kids are a bit older, you move to the Terran books. Hey, speaking of the Narnia Chronicles, I've got all of them. Here's the first one. This is the, well, we had, like, books one through... No, I take that back. We had a few of this edition growing up, so I made sure to pick this one up when I got older. Um, this, this is where you want your kids to start with fantasy. It is extremely simple, it is extremely pared down, and it is well written for what it is. When you read it again as a grown-up, you're going, well, there's really not much to this, is there? It's kind of, this happens, this happens, this happens. It's still an interesting story, though. Just the idea. I think our imaginations are still captured as grown-ups just by the idea that you could just Climb through the back of a wardrobe, enter someplace else. Just like that. Don't we all dream of that sort of thing? Don't we all fantasize about it? Well, I know I do anyway, okay. Um, so, again, this is very simple. I remember my husband read it, and he had not read it as a kid. He read it as a grown-up. So he, big fantasy guy, and he was fairly disappointed. I still remember him flipping through and going, All right, Peter's first battle. And half a page later, he's like, That's it? <laughs> It really, that's it. It's like, hon, you have to remember these books are written for kids, young kids. And that's all you need because you remember it differently until you reread it as a grown-up and you're like, that's it? But in your mind as a kid, it's bigger. It's this whole huge thing. And of course, you can't really mention the Chronicles of Narnia without pointing out that it's a religious allegory. It's a Christian allegory. Very much so. Very strong. So, like... If you're really not into that, maybe don't read it, but I wouldn't say Okay, so apparently my phone is really low on recording time, so quickly, quickly, Alice in Wonderland. This is my old beat-up copy. I love Alice in Wonderland. Not everybody is going to love Alice in Wonderland, because it's a sort of story where Alice has her adventures, but she's a static character. Every chapter is, here's an adventure, here's an adventure, here's an adventure. She goes through them, and then she goes home. 
And that's about it. There's not much else to it. She's not changed by her adventures in any way. I still love it because I love the weirdness. I love the goofiness. If you like wordplay and stuff like that, you're going to love it. I mean, yeah, still a big fan. But yeah, it's that sort of story. It's not for everyone. There's a plane. I'm going to keep filming. Heidi, I really like this book still. And I've got this beautiful edition. I've had this since I was a kid. Isn't it gorgeous? Oh my God, look at that. Oh, it's beautiful. And it's the same thing inside. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, I love it. Um, it's really, again, this is beautiful description writing. It makes you want to go and live on the Alps. She gives enough description to the Alps that I would hope so. It is more religious than I remembered. It is um, maybe not in the same vein as Lion Witch in the Wardrobe, but, you know, um, very Christian. Um, Heidi is taught to put her faith in God and uh, pray and etc. and all that type of thing. So if you're not into that, you know, or if you are, then <laughs> yeah. So um, different things for different people. Uh, but that's what to expect there. The Secret Garden. Ooh, look how beat up this thing is. It's got a page falling out. Oh. Ah, yes. My good old copy. Um, I do love this one. Um, the interesting thing is when you read it as an adult, you realize how small this garden must have been. It seems huge when you're a kid, but, I mean, the entire garden, the entire gardens of the estate are pretty huge, right? But this is just one small area. It's fenced in. It's probably decently big for what it is, but then again, it's not actually that big a space. And it's just this magical corner. Um, it makes you want to get out and grow stuff. Um, interesting because I haven't much of a green thumb, so, um, but it'd be worth trying, right? Um, and the other thing is, again, product of its time. Mary is raised in India, and um, she is a big old jerk face to her nanny, her Aya, and um, she never really addresses that or resolves that. There's some definite racism going on there, and the way that uh, Martha the Maid, who becomes her friend, addresses the situation. Again, very much a product of its time. That is what people knew and understood. And um, it's not apologizing for it. It's explaining it. This is just how it was. Um, the thing is that Mary learns and grows. There's the allegory with the garden. She's growing, um, as does the garden. Um, and she learns to question some of her assumptions. So it's hopeful, or I'm hopeful, that she would address that um, past the events of the book, that there, there would be a reckoning there. Deadline at Spook Cabin. Now, this is not a very known book. It was part of the uh, absolute rash in the uh, 50s of white bread kids solving crimes. There was a lot of that to entertain the, the youngins in the uh, white bread Right, ugh, I can't talk. White red suburbs, um, but this one, this one is just a nice, light, silly little book, and it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Mitch and his friends go and solve crimes, um, and that's it for its time. This is interesting. Uh, Mitch is raised by a single mom. I don't remember exactly what happened to his dad. I think he passed away. That's the typical thing because divorce. But no, no. Um, but still, he's being raised by a single mom who's out and working and doing her best. Also, um, Mitch is very interested in the newspaper, which, like, you know, then you can teach your kids with the newspapers, heck, you can teach yourself if you're not sure. Um, and it's mostly men who work on that, except for the lady who runs the society column, because that has to be, you know, late. Sorry I got cut off there. My camera's being really weird. Okay, so anyway, she manages to get in a good dig or two about, you know, what the men expect of her and all that, and how her work is really quite good, and she's good at her work. Last, but certainly not least, is Understood Betsy. Now, I read this once, maybe twice when I was a kid, and I wish I had read it more because reading it as a grown-up was just... It's about this little girl who is raised to be shy and retiring and scared of everything. Then she goes to live with relatives who expect her to shudder, do things for herself. And she finds out, by doing them, she finds out that she is capable of doing them that she can be independent. And it's just this great story, this little girl maturing, and it's wonderful to read. I wish I had paid more attention to it as a kid. 
Okay, so that's all I got for now. Gotta speedily finish up before my camera stops recording randomly, which it's been doing. Okay, so that's fun. I had fun going through these. Oh, it's a great going through, you know, nostalgia trip and all that. Uh, what are your childhood favorites? List them down in the comments. I want to see if I read any of them. And if not, you know, maybe you can recommend something. I will see you next time. Goodbye. Farewell. Auf Wiedersehen. Adieu.